Good morning, and welcome to worship here at Christ Church of Longboat Quay. We're glad to have you with us, whether you're here in the sanctuary or joining us by the live streaming broadcast of our service. Whatever and whenever you watch, we are delighted to have you sharing in today's worship. It's a particular pleasure to welcome Kathleen McBurney Brandt to the musical leadership of our worship this morning. We're glad indeed to have you sharing with us today. Just a couple of um, brief announcements. Uh, with the ongoing concern over the pandemic, we appreciate the loyal way in which you have tolerated all the protocols that we have been forced to implement in our endeavor to keep everyone as safe as we possibly can. Included in that, of course, is the restrictions on congregational singing, which I know many of you have found to be a trial and a vexation. I know that because we've spotted one or two of you quietly sitting in the pews singing along. Well, as long as you keep your masks on, and as long as you keep the volume down, if that's a more meaningful way to participate in the service, don't feel too guilty. We've taken the slides out of the video presentation about not singing, uh, but it's entirely optional, and we hope that we will be able to allow a more meaningful participation in the worship, even if you're not standing and singing with full heart and voice the way you would dearly love to do so, particularly in the Christmas season. And as the service proceeds, um, please keep your masks on all through. Um, it's for the safety of everyone. And if you remember my mistake last week in trying to speak with my mask on, you'll understand why when we're leading worship, we take the masks off, but then we put them on again immediately thereafter. Despite all the restrictions, we try to keep aspects of church life going, and one of the aspects that we always want to keep going is our warm welcome to any visitors and any potential new members who may come to share with us in our worship. And if you are among that number and are interested in closing a, a, a cl making a closer connection with Christ Church, please stop at the welcome desk as you leave worship and pick up the information packet that we offer to people who are prospective new members. We would be delighted to welcome you to the fellowship of what I can promise you is a wonderful congregation. It's getting to that time of year again. Uh, we have uh, one more Sunday in Advent, and then Christmas Eve is upon us before we know it. And as we always do, we will hold a candlelit service on Christmas Eve at 5.30 p.m. And as we've been doing since the beginning of September, we do ask you please to register for that service, not just so that we can manage numbers, but so that we know who is in worship in the, God forbid, awful possibility that we need to do contact tracing because someone has come down with the virus. So, as I started by saying, thank you for your support. Thank you for your tolerance. With God's grace, we will get through this crazy time together. Friends, we are here for one important purpose, to offer God our worship and our praise. Good Christian friends rejoice.
And now let us join in prayer. Eternal God, you give us joy in the gift of life, yet we dim that joy by chasing wrong goals and taking on the burden of unreal expectations. Forgive us for our lack of joy in living. You intend us for joy in our relationships, yet at times we are shallow and self-centered, needing affirmation but slow to return it. Forgive us for our lack of joy in loving. You offer joy in believing, yet we are often careless, distracted, easily conforming to the thinking of the world. Forgive us for our lack of joy in believing. By the coming of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, restore to us the joy of believing and the calm of sin forgiven. Amen. Friends, Scripture assures us that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself, no longer holding our misdeeds against us. We trust God's grace and rejoice in God's forgiveness. in the knowledge of God's love. Come, Lord Jesus, fill our hearts with joy and peace in believing. Let us walk in the joy of the Lord. As we say each Sunday, we continue to be grateful for the faithful support of members and friends in sending their gifts and pledges to enable the life of the congregation to go on and our support of the mission agencies we care about to continue. There are offering plates at the door as you leave the sanctuary this morning and whether you've already given or intend to give or intend to give next Sunday, we wish to acknowledge that all our giving, however it comes in, is an expression of our faith and part of our commitment to the praise of our God. And so, we dedicate our giving and our gifts. Let us pray. Thank you, loving God, for the blessings of faith, for the privilege of serving, for the opportunities to give to the work of your kingdom. Bless every gift, we pray. Thank you for all the people in whom the spirit of giving thrives and who offer themselves particularly at this time in the service of others, doctors and nurses, hospital auxiliaries, first responders, medical researchers, seeking to combat and roll back COVID's fearful impact. Thank you also for the people in whom the gift of giving finds expression in daily acts of assistance, care, encouragement, and reassurance. Those who resource the needy, remember the lonely, and live with courage and courtesy and cheerfulness, despite the worries and uncertainty. Bless them all, we pray, and use their gifts to heal our broken world and give peace and hope to every broken heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first scripture this morning is from Isaiah 35, verses 1 through 10. 
The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong. Do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For water shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. The haunt of jackals shall become a swamp. The grass shall become reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there, and that shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. No lion shall be there nor shall any ravenous beast come up on it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Amen. Our second reading today is from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel." Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
I try to disguise it, but you've probably picked up uh, that I get nervous when I preach. Still do after all these years, but when I first started in ministry, I was terrible. Really uptight, nervous, strained. And I guess it showed. I remember as an assistant minister in Edinburgh one Sunday preaching a sermon on joy. And the church secretary, a lovely lady who made support and encouragement of raw assistant ministers, her special ministry, came to me and said, how can you preach a sermon on joy and yet show so little joy when you're preaching? And I said, well, I was nervous. I was under pressure. But she had a point. My friend Andrew Purvis didn't need that point being drawn to his attention. In the last church I served, Andrew was preaching about God's presence with him during his serious brush with cancer. And he quoted Psalm 30, verse 5, Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And Andrew wanted us to know he wasn't just talking about relief, morning's here, or let's get back to normal. He was talking about joy, and he called it noisy, rambunctious, neighbor-annoying joy. And so, between our two services, I asked him about that line. No, he said it was not in the script. It had come to him spontaneously. Make sure it's in the script for the second service, I said, and anywhere else you preach that sermon. It's a great line, noisy, rambunctious, neighbor-annoying joy. And so, Andrew did. He repeated it at the 11 o'clock service. And that congregation burst into applause, unheard of, because that church is big on reverence in worship, formality, decently and in order, all that stuff. The kirk didn't do applause, especially at 11 o'clock. What made them do it? I suggest they were expressing a desire for joy. The word that you type in bold print, block capitals, each letter a different color, and you festoon the, world, the word with stars and streamers. It's not happiness, it's joy. Like that guy in the bank advertisement on TV who's so excited about his credit card that he shouts about its benefits to all his neighbors. And then his next door neighbor points out that he's only standing a few feet away from him. Why are you shouting, he said. And the guy replies, it's what I do. Joy is irrepressible. And yet, joy is in very short supply these days. What with the cold snap in the weather, the colder political turmoil in Washington, and the pandemic, we could all do with an injection of joy these days, could we not? Well then, we've come to the right place. We read today about wise men following a star and being overwhelmed with joy. It's a kind of pity that we don't always take the wise men sufficiently seriously. 
Sure, they march across our Christmas cards. They feature in our Christmas carols. I nearly said they star in our Christmas carols, but that would have been an unforgivable pun. And, of course, they're big in the children's Christmas pageant in church. This year, of course, the pageant's different. The children are still there wearing dad's bathrobe and a kitchen towel on their heads, but the pageant has gone digital, streamed into the congregation's worship virtually. The church tech wizard includes night skies from the planetarium website. The wise men have satellite navigation on their camels and they wear night vision goggles. And the journey in the pageant takes place in front of Zoom-supplied backgrounds, showing Jerusalem, Herod's palace, and Bethlehem. And then they pull out their mobile phones and take photographs of the baby and his mother before they leave. That's the kind of way we think about the wise men. But friends, they're not in the story to entertain children. They're in the story to educate adults. They've come from afar. They're seeking a new king. Today, we would call them seekers. They lived at a time of intense longing for a better world kind of the way we do as well. But back then, in some of the ancient writers whose works have survived, we find several traces of the fact that it was known that there was a, an almost worldwide longing for a new divine ruler who would come and put the world to rights. And so, the meaning of their journey to Bethlehem and their discovery of the Christ child lets us see how God responds to seekers and offers acceptance. Now, it was a serious seeking they were engaged in. Their fulfillment didn't happen instantly. It involved a long journey a commitment to pursue this search wherever it led, a willingness to ask questions, a willingness to be discerning in their response to what they discovered. And notice the way Matthew tells the story. They were overwhelmed with joy, not when they found the Christ child, but when, after leaving Herod, they saw that the star was still there before them. They were still being guided. God was still leading their search and leading them towards its fulfillment. Their joy was the joy of discovering that God honors honest, serious seekers. And this, of course, resonates with the pilgrimage many people are on as they seek for faith. Some people, of course, find faith quickly, take a decision, and by God's grace it sticks. Wonderful. But many others have had to take a slow, circuitous path towards faith. C.S. Lewis began his life in academia, determined that he was going to stay in control of his life. He had no need for religion. But across the years, people came into his life who unsettled that conviction. Things happened that made him stop and reflect on its possible meaning. And bit by bit, these events and these people nudged Lewis 
towards faith. These pointers pointed one way. And when the pointers left him no alternative but to embrace faith, even that was a slow two-part process. He began by acknowledging the existence of God. He became a theist. He believed there was a God. But it took some time to get from that to a position where he was prepared to bow down and acknowledge Jesus as Savior and Lord. And as he tells of his journey towards faith, he calls all the people and the incidents that nudged him forward, he calls them arrows of joy. And when he was finally a committed Christian believer, he summed up his experience as surprised by joy. Joy in the discovery that God honors honest, serious seekers. And so, if you're on a pilgrimage, if you still feel that you are seeking, maybe even just seeking a deeper faith, keep going. Don't give up. God honors honest, serious seekers. And that is surely why the Christmas that Advent leads to is a festival of joy, joy in the reality of this love from God, inspiring seekers, forgiving sinners, changing lives. And I say that because change, too, is part of the story of the wise men. Perhaps like me, you have some disappointment in the way modern translations have changed bits of the story. We grew up learning that the wise men had come to Jerusalem to worship the new king. Modern translations change that. They talk about they came to Jerusalem to do him homage. And that's probably a correct change. You see, the word in question was first used of people bowing before rulers, acknowledging their authority. And then later it developed its meaning to cover what we think of as worship. And so, the original meaning of the word, just secular homage, invites the suggestion that perhaps the wise men came as ambassadors, as diplomats, to pay respect, politely to acknowledge the start of a new regime. Maybe they hoped to reconcile ancient enmities. Maybe they wanted to sign a treaty or draft a trade deal. And if you think about it, their gold, frankincense, and myrrh were more appropriate as a tribute to honor a powerful leader than as gifts for a baby born into an artisan household. Now, these men were used to the corridors of power, and they knew to be careful to appraise the people who wielded that power, and it didn't take a huge amount of discernment to get a handle on old Herod. First, there was his anger, barely suppressed when he heard them talk of a newborn king. Then they saw his fear, barely concealed, because Herod was paranoid that his grasp on power was precarious. And then when he told them to return and tell them where they'd found the child, well, these guys could smell a hypocrite from a hundred yards. 
And despite being saddle sore, they couldn't wait to get back on their camels. And when they dismounted at Bethlehem and saw Mary, Joseph, and the baby, when they saw the humility, when they felt the love, when they were warmed by the welcome they received, despite being foreigners who arrived inconveniently, the realization dawned. This was what they had come for. This is what God had wanted them to see, indeed had led them to see. And in that moment, their whole perspective was changed. Their worldview was challenged. God's love upended the expectations of what a Messiah to rule the world would be. They were changed too, surprised by joy. As ambassadors, they had lived among the love of power. Now, at Bethlehem, they perceived the power of love, and their joy in that perception changed them. And it strikes me, friends, that for 2020, Christmas gives us the chance to show the world the power of joy to change things and make them new. So many of the issues we face as a nation need the healing balm of joy poured on them. There's so much anger, so much division. One of the big issues, of course, is racism. Now, the racism of the ancient world would have excluded the wise men from the East. God didn't. God led them and wrapped them in joy. Addressing modern racism, Ker Kelly, sorry, Kerry Connolly has written a book that she admits is confrontational and upsetting called Good White Racist with a Question Mark. And after it was published, one reader wrote an angry, nasty post on her Facebook page. Her initial reaction was she wanted to respond in kind but she didn't. I must have been having a good day, she said. God and the angels must have been in charge. She changed her approach. She apologized for the upset her book had caused. She offered the guy a refund of his 12 bucks. And from that gentle response, a dialogue developed. And she got to see more of previously angry George. She says, I thought it was pretty cool that George cared so much about his daughter's opinion. It was because his daughter had called him a racist that he went and bought the book to try to find out. It was, it was cool, she said, that George cared so much about his daughter's opinion and the fact that he was willing to buy a book to find out if he was a racist or not that demonstrates a real willingness to learn. He was a dad who loved his daughter. He was a man who didn't want to be a bad person. He was a guy who got uncomfortable and offended when he was presented with an opinion different than his own. He was being deeply human. A healing conversation developed. And knowing that I was going to be preaching about joy, I checked her book out. I was sure I would find in this book a stellar 
quotation that would just nail this sermon. So I did an online search of the book. No results for joy. Zero. Now, of course, I understand that racism is a horrible, deep-seated problem. And I understand that the pain and injustice of racism will not easily be healed. Nevertheless, I was disappointed to discover that she hadn't even once mentioned joy. Because we need joy to heal. We need Christian joy to grace our disagreements and lead us deeper into truth. In fact, I would say that if you dig deeply enough, any act of Christian service is an expression of joy somewhere, somehow. And if digging deep you don't see joy, I would say it was questionable whether it really was Christian service. Or if it was Christian service, it was not being done in a Christian manner. And I say that because God's joy throbs all through Scripture. From creation and the hymn in the book of Job speaks of the heavenly beings and the morning stars singing for joy when creation came into being. So from creation, through redemption, and on to kingdom come, joy is the gift God wants to share with all God's creatures. And at Christmas, that joy came among us. The joy that honors honest seekers, that forgives repentant sinners, that graces genuine believers, that strengthens faithful servants, that joy from God that offers peace and hope and joy eternal. So what the world needs now is joy. And to get it, what the church needs now, and with it the world, is Christ. Let us pray. Living God, by Your Word, we live and move and have our being. As You have illumined our hearts with the glory of Your love, first glimpse in the baby of Bethlehem, and then confirmed throughout Christ's joyful life. So awaken in us a sense of Your presence, a trust in Your grace, a desire to share Your joy, that we may praise and thank You for all Your goodness, for the humility of Jesus and His willingness to enter human life, we thank You. For those who follow in His way and show the world the strength that is hidden in weakness, we thank You. Thank You for the obedience of Mary, for the righteousness of Joseph, for the commitment of the wise men, seeking the meaning of the star and finding the glory of God's accepting and inclusive love. God, accept our glad thanksgiving for all You have given us through Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray, dear God, for Your blessing on those 
who need your blessing at this time. We pray for those who are anxious in the season of celebration or hungry in the season of feasting. We pray for those who are lonely in a series of people gathering or grieving in a season of joy. We pray especially for those whose Christmas the pandemic spoils, those restricted from being with loved ones, and we pray for those people who make Christmas one of their annual visits to church and who will miss this year the chance to hear of your love for them. We pray for those who are childless amid the celebration of a birth or homeless in a season of belonging. We pray for those who are listless in a season of God's purpose or who feel unloved in a season of love. We pray for those who are unbelieving in a season of worshiping or feel angry in a season of loveliness. God of grace and goodness, they are all your children, objects of your eternal love, targets of your divine joy. Come now to our world through Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, to right our world and save us from our sins. Help us as followers of Jesus to live our gratitude and faith and show the grace and love by which you have grasped us in how we interact with others until at the last you bring us to Jesus and the joys of your kingdom. And now, as Jesus taught us, we pray rejoicing. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
let us pray. Confirm in us the joy of our salvation, our searching ending when we were found by you, our lostness finished when we were reconciled to you, our sense of wonder constantly renewed by fresh awareness of your love divine. Let it be so, dear Lord, this day and every day. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face. Hey!